Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Susie Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. My guest today says this, you can't just make yourself fearless. No one in the in the Bible says, wow, we have a lot of self-generated faith, so let's go do some death-defying stunts. He says, people are mostly afraid all the time. We can only become fearless as we follow God and our true identity and experience real life, the truth of God's promises to us. So I'm saying that again. We can only become fearless as we follow God and our true identity and experience in real life the truth of God's promises to us. My friend Jamie Winship joins me each month for an identity check. And today, at least for the first part of our conversation, we're going to explore how to literally overcome fear with active, engaged faith. We don't wait for that fearlessness to come to our doorstep. We're going to overcome fear by facing what we fear with an active and engaged faith. We'll be drawing from Jamie's book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truths of God. I've got a handful of copies to give away today. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing. It's a great book. 877-933-2484. Quick announcement here. If you're traveling this season, we'd love for you to take us with you. Did you know we have a free faith radio app? You can live stream from anywhere. You can listen to podcasts after the show. Go to your app store, search for Faith Radio Network. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening, and thank you for taking us with you as you travel. All right, let me tell you about my guests. We'll get them on the show. Jamie has decades of experience bringing peaceful solutions to some of the world's highest conflict areas. Starting with a distinguished career in law enforcement, his unconventional efforts to bring about societal and racial reconciliation led him to Indonesia, Jordan, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, back to the U.S. again. He's worked with leaders in a variety of sectors from police departments, pro football teams, faith-based organizations. He's the author of Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. Dear Jamie, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Always good to be here. I'm always nourished by our conversation, so I'm looking forward to digging in. And You know this because you're on all the time. My first question is the same one. As you spend time with the Lord these days, what's he impressing upon your heart? Um, wow. Just dealing with, uh, the issue of anger, which is directly related to fear, but anger, Mm. um, has been something we've been running into a lot in people that we're working with and talking to and ministering to. So even this morning we're, we were working on, um, a program with inmates and the number one issue is just the level of anger. That's sort of the well, it, it, it doesn't have to be rage. It's just a low boil anger that's been present in people's lives for so long. They don't notice it anymore. It's like they're functionally angry. Wow. And so how do we address that? And it, it's super fascinating in the scriptures, how Jesus is dealing with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's, I've been working on that a lot in the last mm-hmm. probably month, even that topic. Mm-hmm. What's God been speaking to you about it? What's he showing you? Well, <clears throat> because because we, there's so much conflict in the world, you know, when you're looking at, um, <laughs> you know, heavy, you know, high casualty conflict all over the place. So you're looking at for, you know, we're dealing with like if when we're invited into these situations, which we get often, it's like, what's the root of the conflict? You know, is it political? Is it religious? It's and, and the root is fear. Oh, it's always fear. Um, so, but, but when people are in fear, the covering emotion, the protective emotion is anger because it gives them a sense of power and control. Um, and so a- anger that is sourced in fear, which is, which is not bad, but, it, but the anger is, is produced. Humans can only be angry at injustice. I mean, that's the only way a human is ever angry about anything is from a real or perceived injustice. So when we go into a situation where everyone's angry, 
it's because they've suffered a real or perceived injustice, which has produced fear in them. Hmm. And the fear moves them to anger. And then, so then what's the difference between righteous anger and anger that's sin? That's what you want to get to. And then, okay, how do we avoid the anger that ends up being sinful or separating versus an anger that leads to the resolution of injustice, which is God's anger? Yeah. I've had counselors on past shows say that anger is a secondary emotion to fear, hurt, or frustration. Right. And you think about, you know, those all three play into an injustice, whether it's real or perceived, because right. some would react, I'm hurt, and they might shrivel, you know, uh, frustration right. um, or um, all out anger. <laughs> and yeah, wow, that's very, very interesting. Well, I, you know, talking about this, the opening about fear. And mm-hmm. that, you know, everybody's afraid all the time in some way, shape, or form. I'd right. love to hear from your story, a time when you felt afraid, but then the small whisper of God helped you activate your faith. I mean, you've got so many stories, and if this is a repeat, I don't even care. But just <laughs> keeping on this topic, I want to hear what you have to say. Well, um, yeah, I mean, the thing that comes to my mind, I guess, immediately is is you know, living in a conflict zone with your kids with you is probably the most fear producing thing. It's one thing to put yourself in that situation or to be invited by God into that situation. It's another to be invited with your whole family to live in that situation, you know, where there's no, it's 24 seven, you're in that conflict zone and you're, you know, you're all, your whole family's vulnerable to it. And so the, the fear pretty immediately is that, you know, is God able to protect anywhere at any time Mm -hmm. against any evil? And so when you're sitting in the comfort of your, you know, like my house in Tennessee, it's, it's not hard. Yeah, sure. God can protect us anywhere. But then when you're in it and it's raging around you, um, then it comes to what, do, do you really believe that? What is your faith really in? And the fear comes up because, well, I don't know, is God, is God able and willing to protect when you've um, intentionally moved into a very dangerous situation? <laughs> so yeah. that, that for me, that, that would be our whole time in Iraq, yeah. the whole, our whole 18 months working there in that conflict zone in 2003 and four, you know, where part of our team was killed. And so you have that, that's the reality of it. People are dying on your own team. What about your own kids that are in the same environment? So Mm -hmm. that was incredibly fearful. Um, And so, I mean, you're only hope either you get, just get out of the situation or you go, you, you use the fear as a directional um, guide toward the lie that you believe. That's the value of fear. It's just pointing you to something that you believe or are doing that is actually hurtful and harmful to you. Hmm. And so yeah. the only way to, the only way to overcome the fear is to go through it, to walk through right. it, which is, you know, of course, Jesus is famous for not only walking people through their fear, but move Christ moving through his own um, perception of what the cross involved. So you, you know, we always say right on the other side of that fear is is the greatest experience you'll ever experience. And so don't avoid the fear. Take the hand of the good shepherd who guides and protects his rod to guide and his staff to protect is the one that will walk you through that valley of the shadow of death. And so every day, really, I mean, I can tell you specific examples in that those 18 months, but every day it's just like confessing, God, this is what I'm afraid of. I I honestly don't believe that you're as powerful here as you are in, you know, my home state. And that's a that's the crisis right there is 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 God really as powerful in a you know Muslim violent context than he is in the Christian world. And or you, the question could yeah. be, I believe you are able. I don't know that you're willing. Because right. people do die. And I think That's when right. we think about that, you know, Scripture says don't fear. Scripture says to take, sh- you know, he's our shelter. He's our protection. 
And then you see situations and hear of situations where persecuted Christians are brutally killed. And you're like, so how mm-hmm. do these promises apply? But then if you look in a little deeper, you hear stories of people who were saying right before they die, you know, seeing and angels are seeing Jesus being snatched right. up and them graduating to heaven. Them going, don't, don't cry for me. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm graduating to heaven. But That's I, right. you know, I was thinking about this whole idea of fear and even the fear of death, which I think the enemy has gotten away with um, in droves in these last several years, just amped up. I mean, we probably haven't had the fear of death as, as much as others in conflict zones have because they live that reality every day, but it moved in definitely to the West with this pandemic. And I was thinking about Hebrews 2.15. Listen to this. It says, and also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who throughout the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. The Israelites throughout their lives were in bondage to a perpetual fear of death. Right. And, uh, I do feel like this is something God wants to deliver us from here and now, not just bide our time till we graduate to heaven so then our faith becomes sight. So talk about that, if you would, for a moment about that. I mean, I think we live, like you were saying, some of these inmates are living with a low functional level of anger. We live with a functional level of fear, but we just have a ton of coping mechanisms so we don't have to face it. Yeah. And that Hebrews 2 passage is so beautiful because it says, you know, Christ took the power of death from the one who had the power of death, Satan. But the real liberation, as you're reading, is from the burden of the fear of death, right? So Mm -hmm. it's death, you know, if if we believe the scriptures, death to live is Christ is the challenge to to die is the gain part of it. So we're upside down on that. You know, yes. we, we perceive dying as some kind of failure or loss, like it didn't work out. You know, we got killed. It didn't work out or somehow it, it's just the most difficult thing is to, is to not think of death as a victory, right? Like the blood of the martyrs is the, is the, is the seed. It's the, it's the witness of the church is the blood of the martyrs. It's like those examples you're giving of, of, you know, people singing while they're burning and that kind of thing is, is the reality. So the only power that the tyrant has over the victim is the threat of death, right? Just the threat of it. The actual death part is going to come whenever. And, and Paul's, the apostle Paul saying death, where is your sting? The sting is gone. So then when we think of death, it's it's not like the actual dying thing for for most people. It's the it's the failure, the abandonment, the I wasn't good enough, God didn't show up. Like somehow it's 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 a it's a failure of the kingdom in a way. And this is the, this is the lie that you're constantly facing. And so when we're talking, people are asking us questions about fear, you know, and how do you live there, and what do you do? It's it, it's like you're afraid of death. That's why you won't even go. It's because of the fear of death. But our fear of death is in any situation, the death of rejection, the death of a job loss, the death of a relationship. Like we're terrified of all of those things. We're trying to avoid all of those things, which just traps us. Like we won't, I mean, just talking to one of my friends just before I got on here with you and he was telling me about this business opportunity and that sounds really good. And I'm, I said, just tell me what you're afraid of. But I knew what he was going to say. It could fail. Right. That's right. That's the fear of death right there. There it is. Um, and so he, he has the opportunity, you know, is with, you know, common sense and lots of prayer and good, good advice from friends and counselors to make a really smart, risky move. I mean, there's risk involved. But the fear of failure is so great, he, he, you know, he's hesitant to do it. So that's why Israel won't go into the land. You know, they make it all the way through and they can't go into the land because of the fear that it's not going to work, that, that they're just grasshoppers and it's not going to work. So the death is at many levels, right? When, when we say, well, we're in the U.S. and we don't face death like people in other countries, that's true. But we're still a we're still dealing with a a sense of death that we're afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. So as we go to break, just friends, I want you to just prayerfully consider and even dare to ask God, what are my coping mechanisms keeping me from? What promised land, what blessings, what experiences of God's provision, protection, direction, am I 
denying myself because I refuse to trust God. Remember what the Psalm says about the, said about the Israelites? They refused to enter the promised land because they wouldn't believe God's promise to love and care for them. So what did they do? They stayed in their tents in the smallness of their circumstance. They grumbled and refused to obey the Lord. We do the very same thing. So Lord, show us our coping mechanisms. Show us what we're afraid of. Show us how we're depriving ourselves of a revelatory experience with you, God. When we come back, Jamie, I'd love for you to share maybe a couple of stories of how you helped people who were afraid um, face their fears and experience the goodness and the provision of God. And friends, just so you know, I'm one of Jamie's projects. On his bucket list is to take me into a really scary situation (laughs) so I can see that God is who he says he is. So when that happens, I'll be sure to report back to you if I survive it. But anyway, Jamie Winship's my guest. We'll be back in a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to our friend Jamie Winship, who joins us every month for an identity check, helping us to live to learn learn to live fearless. His book is Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. I think we have copies to give away, so I'm going to give you that number. Text the word book to 877-933-2484. And we're talking about truly, truly overcoming our fear of death because death is graduation to heaven, and uh, and God is there to meet us. It's maybe the dying we're afraid of and the process by which we may die, but there's God doesn't want us to bide our time, prop ourselves up in all kinds of ways, take no risks whatsoever, minimize our chances of getting hurt in any way. That's not how he wants us to go out, right? He wants us to follow him and trust him. And so the question I asked before the break is, what coping mechanisms are you and I using? What ways are we depriving ourselves of an experience with God because self-preservation feels better than trusting God and his revelation. So, Jamie, I would love for you to share just a couple of stories that come to mind of people who, uh, like me, maybe battled some pretty significant fears, and you lovingly helped them jump into the deep end of the pool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just thinking because we, we do this pretty regularly with with people. So, um, I'll, I can give, I'll give two examples. So one, one extreme and one not quite so extreme. So, um, I've talked about this person before, but I, I think it's just such a good example. So, um, I was working with a, um, police department and the, the way I, with a large metropolitan police department and the way the police department was working, if this is, you know, this is what, what, any any believer is capable of working in this kind of process. It doesn't. You don't have to be some kind of expert. You just have to be able to give away what you yourself are experiencing in your own walk with Christ. So if I'm experiencing confession, which is truth telling, repentance, which is mind change, and then form change, transformation, I can like I'm a witness to another person. I don't need a PhD to do that. I just need to be able to live it and then it, and then witness it to another person. So this police department, whenever they would have a disciplinary problem with an officer, they would send them to a psychi- a certain psychiatrist, you know, for treatment and care and all that stuff. But the psychiatrist, a lot of the people that were sent to him um, didn't need medication. They needed inner healing. And so the psychiatrist contacted me. He's, he's a, he's a well-known psychiatrist. And he called me and he said, asked if I would come meet with them, um, about this issue in the police department. So I go to meet with them and, uh, we, we meet to have lunch at this restaurant. And he tells me, I mean, I knew who he was, but he tells me, you know, where he went to medical school and all this stuff. And he said, this is the situation I have with the police department. They send me all these people, um, these people don't need medication. I don't want to give it to them. And the psychiatrist is a believer. And so he said, I don't want to prescribe things to people that don't need it. Um, I want to help them, but I don't know exactly what to do with them other than the medical part of it. Can you help me figure out what to do with them? And I said to, I said to him, um, 
what is it that you're afraid of in dealing with them? That was my question to him. Like you have these people, they don't need medication. So you're a psychiatrist. What would you do with them as a believer? And he said, he said, I don't know. And I said, what, what are you afraid of? And he said that, that I wouldn't, that spiritually I I'm incapable of helping them. Like I know medically what to do, but spiritually I feel incapable. And I said, what, what, what are you afraid of? And he said that I'll hurt them. You know, that'll damage them. If I go outside what I've been trained, he's from Harvard, what I've been trained in and everything, I would hurt him. That's his fear that I'll fail, that I'll, you know, fail, lose my job, all that stuff. And I said, so I said, so where did you learn to be afraid of that? Like fear is learned, right? You learn to be afraid of failure. And so we talked a little bit, and this is what's interesting for human beings. They don't always know what the fear is pointing to. This is, this is how you can help a person. Like, tell me, okay, you're afraid of failure. What happens if you fail? Well, then if I fail, I'll, you know, then, you know, I can lose my career. And, and, and I said, okay, so let's say you lose your career. What's the worst thing that happens about that? And, and then he, he, all of a sudden he says to me, he said, you know what? He goes, I, I, the real, the thing is, I don't have joy at all anyway. That's what he said. Hmm. So what he's afraid of is that he's never experienced joy himself as a successful believer. And he doesn't know how to walk another person uh, into joy. And so I said, well, let's figure out where did you lose joy? But, and that was his biggest fear was to tell me personally and then to for people to know as, as successful as he is he's never been joyful and it scares him like he doesn't know what else to do to be joyful and i said joy is a fruit of the spirit it's not something you can drum up so we so we prayed we we, we started at we were at lunch at this restaurant we were at that restaurant and an outside part of it until they closed at 10 o'clock at night that's how wow. long he and I prayed together because he was so schooled in psychiatry. I had to work through all the layers of the training and to get down to what he, where he lost his joy and where he lost his joy was he was so performance oriented as a high school kid, you know, from learning from his parents, he never went to a prom. He never went to a party. He never goofed around. He was in the library studying all the time, all the way through university, all the way through medical school, everything, no fun, get the degree, be the best you could possibly be. And he was mad about it. He was angry that he had sacrificed all those years of his life to be a famous psychiatrist, and he never enjoyed it. There was no joy involved in it. And so, um, so we, so he got all the way to that, and then he 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 asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to know about joy? And the Lord said, I never asked you to study at that level of it was just drudgery. Right. And there's no joy. There was no celebration. It was just like, be the highest achiever, be the best one. And so he told, he, he, the Lord said, I, I, um, I, I wanted you to have joy. And do you remember the moments of joy that happened through? And so he started to remember, oh, there's a moment of joy here. And then he met his wife in university and that was a moment of joy. And so, and so as he went through these moments of joy, his anger started to subside. Right. Because it wasn't an injustice because God isn't the one that sentenced him to that life. And so he started to release it and the Lord started to show moments of joy. And then I asked the Lord, would you show him what his life would look like right now if he was in his vocation with joy? And he had this image in his mind of he, he drove this little beat up car because he didn't want anyone to know that how wealthy he was. And that was part of his sentence. You know, it was just interesting how he came up with all these hard things to do in his life. And so he was driving down the road in his, in his mind, he was driving down the road and his car turned into like a Porsche or something beautiful like that with a convertible top and the top mm -hmm. blew off and the wind was blowing through his hair and Jesus was next to him in the car going, drive faster, drive faster. Wow. And he started just to laugh while we were doing this together and his fear went away that he was going to do his whole life with no joy, just serving God, no joy, and that he couldn't bring joy to these other 
to these police officers that were coming to him. So that was his big breakthrough in that night. And so then we started working together. And then the very first officer, I can tell you in another segment, but the very first officer that he and I experimented on together with him using his joy to refer him to me, rocked to the whole police department and what happened to that one officer. Okay, so like you gotta you gotta hold that story. I, I got to hear that story. So we have to take a break, but I don't want to miss that story. And Jamie, you've not ever said, told us this story. So this is amazing. <laughs> and it just goes to show you, you know, that there are layers and we need, you know, more people like Jamie and Donna, um, just God raise them up so that we can help people walk people to that healing That's place. Right. And it's one of the reasons this show exists is just helping to kind of sow the seeds of belief that, that God loves you and he wants you to know joy. Joy is the fruit of the spirit. Yes. I remember Ren Collective in a video, they're, uh, you know, I think they're Irish band. I can't remember, but they're worship band. But they said, we learned after working so hard for God, seriousness is not a fruit of the spirit. <laughs> joy is. And uh, yeah. boy, that is so sure. powerful. So we're going to take a break here. When we come back, I want to hear about that first officer. And I think the picture of this, setting this up, is so good because, they, as they say, hurt people hurt people, and healed people heal people. So when we're functioning in the fullness of what God wants to do in and through us, and we come into the fullness of who we really are in Jesus, our help becomes more helpful. You know, the hope that we inspire others with becomes more hopeful. So we've got a great story on the other side talking to Jamie Winship. We'll be back in a minute. A blessed day to you. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. Oh, my goodness. If you just tuned in, once the live show's over, please go back and listen to the podcast from the beginning. Before the break, Jamie. Jamie Winship is my guest today, one of our favorites. He joins us every month. We're talking about overcoming fear. And before the break, you told the story of a psychiatrist, well-known, uh, top-of-the-line psychiatrist, believer, who was uh, needing to help police officers, but it was triggering his own fears of failure. And you did some ministry with him and helped him get to the place of when uh, just joylessness had entered his life. And God led him to a place of renewed joy, of seeing Jesus as he is and himself as he is. And so then you two partnered together. And tell us, Jamie, about the first police officer that you guys helped together. Yeah, so once the, <clears throat> once the doctor was released, you know, to move in joy, then, then failure wasn't what, what prevented him from doing things like, then it was like, well, let's just see what God has. So he gets, so the first person, the first police officer that is sent to him, uh, after our experience, our prayer time, the Lord really meeting the psychiatrist was an officer who was on his third disciplinary action for violence on the job. And so the third time is like, yeah, if you don't work it out this time, your, your career's done. So this guy gets sent to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist <laughs> says, realizes pretty quickly, wow, this guy doesn't have any joy. And I'm now an expert in how to get joy. So mm -hmm. he, know, he has this process in his mind. And so he, he starts to talk to the officer about joy, which he's never done before. And the officer reacts to it. But then the psychiatrist is like, I'm actually pretty new in this joy thing. Um, so I'm going to refer you to my colleague. So he refers him to me. Um, so I meet this guy. So he, this police officer, he's like 10 years on. He is very, he's a very angry person. So again, uh, Susie, as you said at the top of the show, the anger is based and sourced in fear. So, uh, so he's angry. He's, you know, he hurt, he's, you know, injured someone on the job in some altercation where excessive force was used. So, um, so I want to, so I know anger is a secondary emotion. We want to get to the fear. So I'm just walking him through that, but he, but he's afraid of me too. I mean, he's angry at everybody. So walking through the anger process, release the anger. What's the injustice that you believe has happened in your life? Okay. Let's truth tell it. Okay. Who stole something from you? Who hurt you? And it, it's not the police department. It's before that, you know, it's earlier in his life. And he had an experience um, as a younger kid with being beat up by people from a different ethnic group than him. And that just produced such deep fear in him and intense anger towards anyone that didn't look like him. 
So then when he comes into police work, which is, you know, maybe not the best vocation for that person, but it's okay. But he just brings that woundedness and fear in. And so when he interacts with any population that's not the same race as him, he he's pretty tough on him like that. So we worked back through the incident when he was young. He felt like God abandoned him, didn't protect him. He has to protect himself, prayed through that process. Um, and God spoke to him in the incident. And God talked about, Christ talked about how when he was victimized or hurt by man, how it turned to blessing for the people that hurt him. It wasn't bitterness. That's the, like that whole process. So we actually did forgiveness of the people that beat him up when he was young. We worked through that process. We released him in forgiveness. God spoke identity into him. Your identity is not a police officer out to, you know, hurt people. Your identity, your, your identity is, it was something like um, lover of the victimized. That was his identity, lover of mm. the victimized. Wow. And so I said to him, do you realize what you could do as a police officer, as a lover of the victimized? Do you realize the power that you have to help people? And he kind of got it. But then as we were praying together, I had the idea. I, let's put him in a situation where he's the only one of his race at all, and he's not in a, he doesn't have the power of the police department. So we actually took him overseas into the Middle East, I and we, we put him in a community of all Muslims, which he had a real issue with, by himself, and we left him there for 10 days. And so, oh, my word, Jamie. I'm not going anywhere up. with you. I'm just not. <laughs> And I said, you, you left you him there. Bad. What? Yeah, okay, I said, you don't have a gun. You don't have a badge. You have Jesus. And if you have a problem with these people, they, they're going to kill you. So you better learn how to use the joy of the Lord in your true identity as a, as a lover of, of the victimized. Um, here's your chance to work it out. And we just basically threw him in the situation. I mean, you know, we watched him. We weren't going to totally abandon him, but we left him. And he discovered this capacity within his true self to really quickly relate to people different than him. And he, he, he realized that these people different than him could really love him and he could really help them. So we did 10 days of that. We brought him back the, with the psychiatrist. They reinstated him probationary on the job. Now, here's the craziest thing. He goes out on his first midnight shift. He's working the midnight shift. There's this car coming down the road that has everything wrong with it. The lights don't work. The tires are terrible. He pulls the car over, walks up, and it's Palestinians in the car hmm. first. And he shines his flashlight in. And typically, this would be a very tense situation for him. He pulls the car over. He says to the driver and the man and woman in the car, and he says, this car, you're going to get killed in this car. It's so dangerous. Why are you driving? This is so unsafe. And the man's crying. And he said, I just picked up my wife from the airport. I haven't seen her in five years. And I'm so, wow. I didn't have a car. This is the only car I could find to go get her. Um, and so the, the officer is so moved. He's like, I was just in the Middle East, you know, and where were you? Anyway, so the officer, instead of like towing their car away and leaving them on the side of the road or anything like that, he, he puts them in his car he calls a tow truck to take the car away, and then he says to him, where do you live? I'll take you home. They, he, they take him to this kind of not good rental place. He said, how much rent are you paying? They tell him, he said, that's way too much. Who's the landlord of this place? He goes and wakes up the landlord of the place and says, you're overcharging these people. I, th this is not legal. I will be coming back here with the civil authorities to talk about how you're you're stealing from these people unless this rent gets lowered. So he works all that out for him. Then he, he, he says, you need to stay somewhere else for the night. He calls around, he finds a local mosque, wakes the guy up and says, you need to, ha these are your people. You need to house them for the night, house them until we get this rental situation. And he just works the whole thing out for it, for these people. Um, the mosque leader calls the police department the next day and said, when did you start training officers to minister to our community like this? Because this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. My so goodness. In his first shift, he gets called in by the department. And not only does he go off probation, they're like, how in the world, who in the world did this with you? He points to the psychiatrist. <laughs> And this, because I wasn't involved, you know, officially, the psychiatrist, the, the police department calls the psychiatrist and says, okay, we're sending every person to you. 
if this is the result. And so then the psychiatrist has to hire other people who understand hearing from God and identity to work with him to handle the number of police officers that get sent to him. Um, the police officer, it, I still am friends with him. He now has a PhD in, in um, like cybersecurity, and he works for some big cybersecurity international firm now, all because of that one psychiatrist discovering joy. And then that's the domino effect that it has. Wow. It just leaves you in perpetual awe when you hear <laughs> stories like this, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. And I mean, it's, it's the opposite, Jamie, of looking for quick fixes. I don't, right. you know, quick uh, solutions to, you know, treating symptoms of fears, treating symptoms right. of of insecurity versus being willing to go the distance. What do you say to the person listening today who says, I, I, I don't want to, I've been living, I've been hiding, I've been trying to just bide my time till Jesus returns, but I don't want to live like this, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to face some of the things that are buried in my soul's basement? What, what should be my first steps? So the, the, so that to that person I was saying earlier, it's all of us, but is everyone deals with fear. Fear is super valuable to help you um, learn lies that you believe about God, yourself, and other people. It's, a, it's an inversion of the great commandment, and you end up separating from God and yourself and other people. So, you, so confession is always the way. Truth-telling is always the way, either by yourself or with a close friend or a counselor, just take a pad of paper and just sit with the Lord and say, Lord, just like David prayed, Lord, search me and know me. And you, Lord, reveal to me. I'm not going to try and tell you. You tell me any way in me that's offensive to you. The offensive ways to God are any ways that we believe something other than what he says about us, about himself, and about other people. And so it's just, Lord, help me to recognize what in my life, what am I afraid of? And as deep down as you can say, I'm afraid of failure. I mean, mine is I'm a disappointment. That's my biggest fear all the time. Ever mm. since I was young, hearing that I'm a disappointment, and I just believe it. And it, it, it's a constant place where the enemy comes to accuse. It won't ever stop, but it doesn't have any more power. But the enemy just keeps coming, but it, but it doesn't have any more power, and I know the process. So when I feel the fear, I'm like, I say right away, Lord, I believe right now that I'm a disappointment. What do you want me to know about that belief? What do you want me to do about that belief? And I tell people all the time, do you know how many times the Lord will meet you in that lie and walk in the truth? Every single time, every single time, but don't cope with it. Don't try and figure out how to cope with it or ask for it to go away. What am I afraid of? Where did I learn to be afraid of this? What lie did I believe about myself, God, or others in, in this experience? And Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. Leave me out of it. What's the truth? What do you say? And it just leads to mind change, which is repentance, and then form change. Let's, what are we going to do differently now? I do this every single day, this process. Mm-hmm. So, friend, as we're getting ready to go to break, think about that. And dare you to ask, you know, pray this Psalm 139 prayer. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything offensive in me and lead me in your everlasting way. And dare to ask him, what lies have I coped with? What lies have I coped with? And what have I done to cope with those lies? Because the enemy wants nothing more than for us to idolize our comfort, because it's not really comfortable to stay captive. It isn't. We think it is. We think it's easier, but it's not. It's not better. And uh, when before we go to break, just one quick question, Jamie. When you bring the lie to, of disappointment uh, to the Lord, what, what are oftentimes the ways that he responds to you? He, well, he, he, he'll ask, like, I'm a disappointment. Like, in what way were you a disappointment? I didn't, I didn't um, love, you know, going to church or something like that. I, I, I didn't say the right thing to the person. And he always says to me, first of all, you are enough. You are enough. He, he never, it's never, I'm always like, can you say I'm more than enough? Nope. You're enough. <laughs> you're enough. That reminds me of another story. <laughs> but you're enough. And then he and then um, I've never been disappointed in you. That's what he always says to me. I've never been disappointed in you. You're enough. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's do it. That's how, just how he. I can. It's like he's 
I can see Jesus standing in front of me like a coach. And, he, and I've stopped because I'm afraid of disappointing. And he's like, come on. And he's walking ahead of me. He's like, come on, let's go. You're not a disappointment. You're enough. You, I've never been disappointed in you. You're enough. Let's go. Let's go. Let's just take the next step. And yeah, I just can see it so vividly in my mind that, that the, I can feel the lie coming and I just head it off. Yeah. This is walking in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's right. The desires of the flesh really come from the enemy, the desires to steal, kill, and destroy from you. And uh, uh, Graham Cook, I read a quote from him years ago. He said, God is not disillusioned with you. He never had any illusions about you in the first place. (laughs) And to be disappointed is to be surprised. And uh, God's not surprised by anything. He knew who he was getting when he got us. And he went to the cross in full knowledge uh, because we were worth it to him. All right. When we come back, Jamie, I want you to tell the story Uh, You tell in the book about a time when you and your family lived in Indonesia. The government collapsed, military police force disbanded, and angry mobs took to the streets. And while many foreign workers were exiting, you felt like you're supposed to stay. And you have your wife. You have your kids. We're going to talk about that on the other side. Jamie Winship is my guest, drawing from his book, Living Fearless, talking about overcoming the fear of death, uh, quitting all the coping that we do around our fears, and daring to just trust God to lead us to places of deeper healing and freedom so that we can help others get to deeper places of freedom. What a call we have on our lives. It's a great adventure. We'll be back in a minute. I don't know about you, but I love consistent nourishment. I love to fast on occasion. There's a purpose in that. But if you go too long without eating on a regular basis because you're too busy, your body actually goes into crisis mode. Well, in the same way, your soul, your spirit, they need nourishment too. And that's why it's so important to be listening to scripture, listening to good teaching on a consistent basis throughout the day. That's why we're here. We love what we do, and we want to do it with you. If you listen on our on the radio and the terrestrial signal, we encourage you, download our free faith radio app. That way, if you're traveling this season, You can take us with you wherever you go. You can catch the live shows or even the podcast after the fact. And we've made it easier than ever. All you have to do is text the word APP to 877-933-2484 and then click the link. I hope you will walk with us on this journey. Greater things are yet to be done in and all around us because God, well, he's on the move. Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, talking to Jamie Winship, who joins us every month for an identity check. Today, specifically, we're talking about overcoming the fear of death, overcoming fears that, you know, some live with kind of, you have surges of irrational fears. I get that, been there, done that. But a lot of people, if not most people, live with a low-level lingering fear that we just sort of leave unchallenged in our souls. And we just cope. We make allowances for and accommodations for, not realizing we're literally depriving ourselves of a fresh revelation and experience of Almighty God, where places He wants to take us, where things He wants to do in and through us that obliterate that fear and, and prove that enemy wrong. And so we don't want to live in ways that give the enemy access to our lives. He doesn't deserve it. And God deserves it. God deserves all access. He deserves our trust. And so Jamie's such a great person to talk to about overcoming our fears. And in the book, Jamie, your book, Living Fearless, you talk about a time when you and your family lived in Indonesia and the government collapsed, uh, the police force disbanded, and the angry mobs took to the streets, looting, burning, carrying sticks and broken bottles. Most foreign workers were exiting. And the Lord told you guys to stay. Take it from there. Yeah. And that, I mean, that was, you know, when I think about that one, that's a, <laughs> uh, that's one I don't even like to think about remembering what the, you know, what was at stake in that, but G- God gives you the grace for the present tense. And that's, that's where he's always present is in the present. So yeah, we just, m- most all of the expatriate community left because they knew it was just going to be a complete collapse and um, just as you described, no, no army, no anything. It just the whole thing fell apart. And that that is a strange feeling when there's no there's n- no recourse to anything. There's no nine one one or anything. You're just no infrastructure. Yeah. That's right. It's gone. Yeah. And so we lived in a city with um, five million Sundanese Muslims, and um, <clears throat> yeah, the expatriate community 
left. And so we were praying and asking God, what do you want us to know? What do you want us to do in this situation? And felt, and I, and you know, I'm, I, I tell people like, this isn't about bravery. This is about just asking for wisdom. But then when you ask for wisdom, then ask for the courage to do the wisdom that's given uh, and to obey it. And so just a very strong sense of um, we need to stay, mainly because our Muslim neighbors couldn't leave. And they were watching what happens to the Christian community when tribulation comes, they leave. You know, the, the the foreign Christians just pack up and go. And we just felt like that's not a, that's not a good witness. So let's stay with our neighborhood. Um, and so we prayed about it. And then, we, you know, we prepared our kids and we prepared, you know, what to do when a mob comes down the street. And, you know, we had cash hidden in the in the house. And so like we you you prepare, you're not crazy you, you you're smart you use common sense but just always asking the lord what's the wisdom from above not just the wisdom from below but what's the wisdom from mm-hmm. above and so we so we just decided to stay through the process and our neighbors um our muslim neighbors <clears throat> told us like if the mobs come down the street we can't i mean there are people we're not gonna we can't get in the way of them and stop them go just you know, the mob will kill whoever's in front of them, but we, you can come and stay in our house. You can come hide in our house. And that's, it was just this kind of beautiful time to bond with them. It was the same in Iraq when we lived in Iraq, but um, so our neighbors and they were like, why didn't you go? Why did you stay? We stayed because, because we love you, because God invited us to be here with you. He's the God who's with, not the God who's with until things get bad. And then he takes off. He's with you, and 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 Paul, the Apostle Paul, in in Acts, when he's in the storm with all the sailors that think they're going to die, he's in the storm with them, telling them, "We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. The God who I serve, who I believe, is with us. But you got to stay yeah. with me." Like that yeah. kind of witness is so powerful to people yeah. because you're, you're you're if they're going to drown, you're going to drown with them. And if you're going to get overrun, you're going to get overrun with them. And so it just you, you, there's no witness greater than that. It was an honor to be there and to see what it did in our kids, you know, just to to see them experience God um, protect them from, you know, when our car got surrounded by this mob and just it was like we were invisible. I mean, that's well, that was the story I wanted you to tell, yeah. because you were in yeah. you were in a quiet neighborhood yeah. and you turned a corner mm-hmm. and suddenly there's hundreds and they're mobs. They got sticks, broken bottles. And Donna panicked a little bit, as I would have. And she asked you what to do. <laughs> and it came out of your mouth. Let kids pray that we are invisible. So the invisible, kids started yeah. to pray that you were invisible. And then what happened? Yeah, then, and then so the, the 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 crowd. I mean, that's horrifying. The crowd is just engulfs our car because there was no way to back out of the situation. And so they just they, it was like a flood hitting your car, but they just parted around it, and our car rocked back and forth. And what was happening prior to that was people in cars, the windows were getting smashed out. People were ripping women's earrings out. They were yanking mm-hmm. jewelry off them. I mean, it was brutal dragging them out of cars. And so we're in that same situation. We're foreigners, you know, it's not like we can hide. And they just went around us. The car would rock back and forth, but nobody broke any windows. No one banged on the car. Um, And it just, it seemed like forever for that crowd to finally pass. And then they just passed and it was just quiet. We just sat there and um, like, thank God, thank you, Lord, for just being, somehow they didn't notice us or see us invisible. And then so I started to, I started to drive forward and our son said, dad, pray that we're visible again. <laughs> um, that God make us visible again. Cause we were invisible. And so what, I, I'll tell you what's super fascinating about this that I, that I want your listeners to get is every God never wastes any time. We might think the time is wasted or we might waste time. God never wastes time. He's building this beautiful tapestry of our lives. And because we stayed in Indonesia through those that time, that whole year and more years after that, like we met people that we would have never met, Indonesian people that we would have never met if we had fled, you know. And mm-hmm. yesterday, this is crazy. Yesterday we were in this meeting and um we're you actually, have thirty we're seconds, a, just letting you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're just we're we're in this meeting about filming and we, we were needed funding for the filming. And the guy I was meeting with said, Hey, do you know a guy named so-and-so? It was an Indonesian guy. And I said, 
yeah, I do. The only reason I know him is because he was there when we stayed in that city. He goes, he's now one of the most famous film producers in Indonesia, and he would love to be a part of whatever you're doing. That came from those days in wow. those years. That's the value of letting God work you through the fear into the wow. faith and what happens. Wow. I don't want to limit him in any way at all. That's right. Jamie, this is so good. Thank you. Thank you. Just when I think, you know, um, we have plumbed the depths of <laughs> what you have to say. No, it's not true. Thank you for the time. We pray God would redeem your time. This has been just fantastic. God bless you, dear yeah. brother. Thank you. Mm. Jamie Winship is my guest. Again, his book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. I don't want this show to be entertaining. I want it to be transforming. So take some of what stood out to you in this hour, bring it before the Lord and ask him, do a new thing in me. In fact, do the impossible, Lord God, in and through me. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.